ओके okay, नमस्ते um, मुझे बहुत खुशी है um, कि ये मौका के लिए आई स्पीक मोस्टली इन इंग्लिश बिकॉज आई नो आई इन्वाइट अ लॉट ऑफ पीपल एंड दे डोंट स्पीक हिंदी सो माय नेम इज डॉक्टर विशा मिमल एंड टू नाइट आई विल प्रेजेंट बेसिकली माय जर्नी इन रिडिस्कवरिंग the language of my grandparents and forefathers um just to give you a, a bit of a context okay so uh my mom's family uh was brahman so that um they my my mom was a pandit and i learned to read and write hindi from him as well as my nana and his brother so at the age of 11 i could read and write hindi and i grew up in a uh, in the trinidadian home where trinidad english creole was spoken as well as trinidad bhojpuri which is one of the languages that come under caribbean hindustan um growing up we understood it was a broken form of hindi but after doing my mbbs i discovered dr peggy mohan's thesis on trinidad bhojpuri a morphological study and it proved otherwise it's a separate language from uh, from modern standard hindi based in bhojpuri so i, I will kind of give that context as to uh, both languages and the uh, the story behind its evolution as well as uh, the current context in which they exist but through the lens of uh, culture so uh, oh yes uh, caribbean hindustani <clears throat> is an organization i set up um, some time ago so we have a website caribbean hindustani dot org as well as a facebook page caribbean hindustani and uh, and a group as well everything i would uh, show this evening is represented in some form or fashion there um as well as the interviews you would see after the powerpoint presentation so you can go to the first slide right everybody knows of indian indentorship it started in the 9 in the 1830s and ended in 1920 um firstly in countries such as mauritius trinidad guyana and then after fiji and suriname that's quite important to understand why because the hindustani that exists uh actually evolved based on uh these times of migration as well as uh the british moving from bihar to delhi and moving to new recruitment areas and get in uh, stocks of uh, hindustani speakers of uh, varying languages um in trinidad it was 1845 to 1917 one key point to note in the evolution of yes i think the powerpoint went off there one key point to note in the evolution of um uh modern standard hindi is that um, at this point of the 1830s i believe the british raj had uh, um, removed the persian language as a language of administration and they started uh, you'd have to yeah go to the the first the slide after the topic slide um yeah and uh, introduced uh, hindustani or which is urdu because it was in a stalic script and um i think uh, the bhojpuri that we know that came was actually written in kaithi script um and there was a movement in india uh based on the book indian nationalism um where the hindus were struggling for their own script of the language which started in that northeastern part of india so that's very key during this indentorship period and at that point khari boli which we know as modern standard hindi um was only now working its way up to become the standard and uprooting the uh prior standard which was avadhi and braj bhasha um it's quite interesting that when my nana and nani would tell stories and they would recite some dialogue in these we say kisa right which is a kahani um they would be in braj and avadhi and my nana could well used to read ram charitramanas uh, explain it in english creole as well as in khari boli so he 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 was literate in the hindustani language um that's how we, he was able to teach me um the kariboli translation as well as the avadi verses 
And then there were Kabir Sakis, which they would recite again, which would be in our the end sometime Baranasi boy. So uh, that was kind of the context in which I grew up. We must identify the regions from where, and we'll look at this in more detail, where indentured laborers came from. So the part in uh, the darker part or the gray parts there, Calcutta and Madras, as you see in, in the map, would be the, the, the ports of um, uh, disembarkation. Um, but the majority of indentured laborers came from that gray area to the top in the northeastern part, part around Faisalabad. Um, what is important to note is that when the British conquered India, um, the, the capital was initially Calcutta, and there they set up the, which is modernly Kolkata, and they set up the Fort William College, which started the story of Kariboli becoming the standard. Um, uh, the initial migration started from, yeah, we go to the next slide, because I think I had explained it in more detail there. Yeah, so if you would look, this is Bihar and this is Uttar Pradesh, and every dot represents a recruitment area. Um, so you would see the, the greatest density is around um, the, the western part of Bihar and the eastern part of Uttar Pradesh. But you must know, this is based on uh, Dr. Peggy Mohan's thesis, is that the initial migrants spoke Sadhani Bhojpuri, which is the Bhojpuri that existed in the Ranchi Plateau and Chutanagpur. Um, and then after the British uh, proceeded westward, they went to the northwestern parts of Bihar and then into Uttar Pradesh, um, the migration areas changed. So that uh, Trinidad, uh, Guyana and Mauritius received a heavy stock of those from Bihar initially, uh, Bhujpuri speakers. And then later on in the 1870s, when it started in Suriname and Fiji, uh, they had now uh, advanced into Uttar Pradesh. Uh, so what is interesting about this linguistically? You look at the next slide. So you see, uh, and, and, and there's a key there to the languages. So you see the red is uh, uh, Hindi, the orange is Braj Bhasha, the yellow is Avadhi, um, and then you have the Magadan languages, which would be uh, Magahi, Maithili, Bengali, Uriya, and Assamese. So I superimpose that initial map onto this linguistic map uh, so you'd see that a lot of the indentured laborers or the highest density of recruitment was in the Bhojpuri belt. Um, only after it, there were, there were more recruitment from the Awadhi speaking area. And I'd look at some interesting things there when we look at the video to explain how Sarnami sometimes could vary from Trinidad, Bhojpuri and Guyanese Bhojpuri. So that uh, the critical mass as demonstrated in the map would be Bhojpuri critical mass in all, well, at least in the Caribbean Hindustani uh, countries, Suriname, Guyana, uh, and Trinidad, which were the majority, well, um, the majority of indentured laborers went to these colonies, uh, the critical mass was essentially Bhujpuri. Next slide. Uh, this, and, and, and yeah, this was adapted from Moti Marhe's, uh, so I mentioned Dr. Peggy Mohan, she did Trinidad Bhujpuri morphological study in the 1970s, and then there is Motilal Marhe. He's a linguist from the Netherlands uh, who was born in Curaçao, but grew most of his life in Suriname until its independence. And he did a significant amount of research on Suriname, or Sur Surinamese Bhojpuri. Um, if you would look at the map, a lot of times people tend to say that uh, Hindi or at least nor nor North Indian or modern Indo-Aryan languages come from Sanskrit. But in fact, just like Latin, French evolved from Frankish Volga Latin and uh, uh, Spanish from Hispanic Volga Latin. Volga Latin is equivalent to Prakrit or spoken varieties of uh, spoken varieties of Sanskrit. So that the Magadhan languages came from the Magadhi or uh, Magadhi upper branch or Magadhi Prakrit, and these would include Bhojpuri, right? The most Western of those, um, the, the five. The five are there. Uh, Bhujpuri being the critical mass of most indentured laborers, 
magahi mai thili uriya bengali ana samis um i i i didn't elaborate as much earlier but remember there were also a significant amount of south indian speakers of tamil um so that uh, some tamil words mm -hmm. form part of our hindustani here in the caribbean um but if you look at shaurasini prakrit the show shaurasini upper branch uh, you would see hindi occur in there western hindi and there hindi is the kariboli which is i have as hindustani but the hindi and urdu and then you have the other languages there so essentially bhojpuri and, and hindi are separate languages portuguese and spanish for instance um in hindi you say if i have well it's trinidad and tobago tobago is the sister isle we are the smaller of the two islands in our republic um if my, if my nani had to say well in hindi i would learn um kal mai tobago jaunga but my nani would say bihan ham tobago jai so there was there, there's a distinct difference there as to do as to the words used um and then i remember my nani couldn't understand kariboli or modern standard hindi and i remember my aji my aja used to at that time it was lakshmana he was the high commissioner he was a, a good friend of the high commissioner and they would come to my aja's house in pinal to have uh, lunch on sundays and my uh, well my, my aji died probably about three years ago but she used to say that she couldn't understand whenever the high commissioner's wife spoke to her in hindi she could only understand some not all so um that in itself from my own uh, personal experience from my grandparents um uh, i could see it was essentially different languages uh my nani was not uh, my nani and aji weren't literate in hindustani so they couldn't read and write it but they could speak it um so that's a valid point going forward here next slide what is they always say that the caribbean or the indo caribbean people's uh our religious text or they call it they call it caribbean Ra ramayan country and the reason is that i spoke of my nana reading ram charitramanas or at least among hindus and again hindus form the critical mass of the migrants so that the majority of indo caribbean people are hindu in suriname guyana and trinidad and uh, i'm not sure if everybody have, would have the same experience but my nana used to read ram charitramanas and make reference to it often and uh, you would see in the other slide when we go to it that uh there there are expressions there that may not exist in hindi but exist in our speech i mentioned that uh, indentured laborers uh, mostly came from the bhojpuri speaking area but later on during indentureship uh, some of them came from the awadi speaking areas um i in, in doing this research because i learned i learned uh, modern standard hindi at university when i was doing my mbbs and after delved into utilizing the structure i learned for hindi grammar to then look at the structure of the uh, hindustani of the caribbean um and then when i had the means to travel i traveled to suriname guyana the netherlands and so on um and uh, it was quite stuck in the, it, it was it was stuck in the differences sometimes so for instance if my nani would say he he saw me it'll be u u hamke dekhal but in suriname they say u hamke dekhis um which initially i didn't understand but i afterwards i realized that it was a uh, it was awadi um so whereas in trinidad bhojpuri we would uh, speak mostly bhojpuri they actually have in some of their conjugation of verbs uh, half bhojpuri half avadi so sanami actually has a avadi flavor so is a bhojpuri with a avadi flavor uh, which is less so in trinidad um when in doing the research and looking at the verses uh, which i have done to caribbean hindustani is i realized that just like during shakespearean times when there wasn't a standard spelling for english and there were variants in spelling because it wasn't standardized the same existed around this period so when i would look at texts of ramcharitamanas the spellings weren't standard uh there were variants in how things were spelled um 
And that also represents an earlier time too, when indentured laborers had come to the Caribbean, Hindustani and Hindi and Kariboli itself didn't reach this standard form that exists currently where we, when we learn Hindi, we learn how to quote unquote properly spell a Hindi word. Um, there are many grammatical forms that resemble Caribbean Hindustani in Ram Charitamanas. And again, because we have that Avadi influence. One thing that is always uh, looked at for Ram and why I focus on Ram Charitamanas, uh, especially in this presentation is that um, when I showed the family tree earlier up, the Magadhi kingdom where Magadhi Prakrit or the Eastern vernacular of Sanskrit was spoken, uh, speaks of Mithila. So Sita was a, a, a Maithili princess and Janak was a, a Maithili king. So that more than likely the Prakrit or the spoken vernacular of Sanskrit that would be in that kingdom would be uh, Magadhi Prakrit and Ram was more, more Western. So uh, we'll discuss the differences and maybe in the conversations between Avadhi and Bhojpuri. Um, uh, and there is a clear grammar and semantic and syntax that exists um, well with regard to the uh, poetic license of Ram Chuchamanas. You could bend the rules of language uh, or what is the standard language in poetry. Um, so that, yeah, even if my nani was illiterate, in Hindustani, if she would hear verses of Ram Chirtamana, she would understand completely. Again, because uh, I guess it's like Guyanese, as a, like Guyanese English Creole and Trinidad English Creole to an extent, because we could understand each other um, if they speak. It might take some time, just like I went to Suriname and heard certain expressions I didn't grow up with. Um, they are mutually intelligible to a large extent. Next slide. So, I'm, I'm not sure of the audience. If we have people, Indo-Caribbean people here, they would know what I'm speaking of. These are verses and excerpts I took from Ram Charitramanas, but they are quite popular in Chutney, which we'll look at, which is now the uh, music in Hindustani that the youth listen to, apart from Bollywood. So in the first one, you, you notice know, more Tor. <laughs> A young person in Trinidad, would know more tour from the chutney more tour, more tour lava milai saki lava milai is a popular chutney by Ricky Jai. Um, I and where you you learn mera um, mera tera in Hindi, so there's a disconnect there. If this is our tradition in modern standard Hindi, we learn something different, and you could see why uh, people would think that Bhojpuri is broken Hindi. It looks kind of similar, but there is a difference. Um, Bhayau and Honeu. So uh, past, we say Bhail here in Ka Bhail, which is Kya Hua, right? Avat, which is quite common in most of our chutneys. Um, it's supposed to be, uh, it's supposed to be, uh, I had C in there, but it was supposed to be the comment that's supposed to be highlighted. Um, the other one is Kawana Kawana, which is very popular in our Logit songs, uh, especially the Sanskar Geet. Um, apan, which doesn't exist in Hindi, but it's apana. And ohi, right? Which is the same as vahi in Hindi. So I guess if there were Indo Caribbean people looking on, these lines would, uh, once I read them out, because oh, the average Indo Caribbean person can't read Dave Nagari, but um, in saying all these words, I think they, it, would, it would be quite familiar to them. Next slide. And uh, well, I tried to look at a comparison of the uh, verb to go, jai in Bhujpuri, but jana in Hindi. And you can see there's a, there's a difference in the inflections to the end, right? Uh, in Hindi there, that's the, what we all know who learned, who learned Hindi. But when we listen to songs in our Logi tradition, as well as even now in Bollywood, uh, you hear the other forms of gayu, jat, gail, and so on. So, uh, that's quite interesting. I guess it could bring up some questions in the question and answer section. Next slide. Um, and then, yes. <clears throat> so I would have grown up with words on the Avadi side, also Bhojpuri. So we don't say Lakshman, we say Lachman, Lachman. We don't say Vishwas, we say Biswas. The House of Bis Biswas is a, is a very uh, a book from V.S. Naipaul. Um, Nam now exists, yes, but we I have more often here Nam. Charna, 
which is kshan in modern standard Hindi, esa, which becomes s or ais. Uh, these are just some examples. Uh, what is important to note is isha. Isha becomes sa in Bhojpuri. The ksha becomes cha. And the, uh, yeah, in two examples here, ksharn and lakshman becomes cha. So uh, these are just examples of words where these are cognates in our devices Hindi. Next slide. Right. So I just explored a little bit of literature, but now I'm going to. Uh, I speak Trinad Bhujpuri, right? Jani Bhatti Awe Trinad Bhujpuri, and Mujhe Hindi Aati Hai Bhi. But nobody else my age can do that, or younger than me in Trinidad and Guyana at least. In Suriname, it's a bit different. It's it's uh, still a, a conversational language. Um, but I highlighted the domains here to give some relevance to where it exists. Even though it's not a conversational language in Trinidad and Guyana, it um, it still exists in the domains of bhojan, bhajan. Well, bhasha, not bhasha as in Hindi, Hindustani bhasha, but the Trinidad English Creole. I'll give some examples of that and uh, Bhish. So uh, it's quite popular to see uh, people wear the Indian garb for cultural events as well as religious events. So it still exists here. It's not like Fiji where they wear it on a daily basis. Um, maybe Ola Indian people would wear it. Like my nani would wear her orni on a daily basis, but it's not usually worn by Indian women in the modern time. Um, so these, and and I wanna, so Bhojan, I look, so I, I like to invite all, all of you to go to Caribbean Hindustani. I did for Diwali a special called uh, Diwali, Diwali Bhojan. And it looked at expressions in the culinary arts of Indo-Caribbean mm -hmm. uh, cuisine. So it looked at uh, things like Manji di Burton, and this is the bhasha coming in here, seki di roti, right? Um, bhunje di curry, right? Uh, a word we use, well, we say, they say talkari, you know, which is anglicized. My nani would say tarkari, which exists as well. Tokha, which is, uh, I'm not sure if it exists in Hindi or used. I know it's in a dictionary, in a dictionary, but it's more UP Bihar that word for that particular dish. Um, bhajan I mentioned before, and bhajan extends, well, I mean, that means the uh, the song expression. So that in, I, I, let's look at the song tradition that came. I mentioned Ram Manas, I mentioned Kabir, Kabir uh, Das, which, which is quite popular. Um, during, the, the, during the indentiture period, Mostly Logit existed, so Sanskar Git um, that that uh, that are quite uh, popular still, and then there were there's the well equivalent to what we call the Shastriya Sangeet tradition. We call it local classical. It's called dancing in Guyana and Baitagana in Suriname, and just like there are classifications of uh, different like uh, Thumri. Um, uh, Drupa and so we, there are classifications, but it's similar in some, in some, uh, the name is similar in some genres. It might sound a little bit different, and then there are different names you also use. The argument currently is, is this an earlier form of the evolution of Shastra Sangeet encapsulated in time in the Caribbean, like everything else, uh, with regard to our culture, because a lot of what is practiced here um, is really pre partition India. Uh, and, and has, has, has evolved into a new context here in the Caribbean, whereas India now would have uh, evolved in a, in a separate vein. So, um, and then the Logit, so after indentureship ended in the 1970s, uh, the Logit, we started seeing these local classical traditions and the same gharanas like you have in Shastra Sangeet existed here for the local classical, so that mostly, actually a lot of these singers here, they actually come from a gharana or family tradition where singing was passed on through their family. Um, uh, I don't know if you know popular singers like Dubraj Pasad, um, uh, Suhan Girari, uh, Rasika Dindyal, 
all these are very popular singers, but they actually come from a Gharana tradition of this local classical singing. Um, we don't know where it came from in the sense of, uh, there's a lot of speculation. I, I, I would like to uh, reference Sharda Patisa here, who, who in her thesis would look at the song tradition, said that uh, there, was, there were Brahmins who migrated and those who sang in the court of the Mughals and uh, would have sang among the villagers and that tradition could have come from there. There are pictures of uh, indentured laborers with instruments. Uh, there's no knowledge in research of formal tutelage, but it eventually evolved into that. Um, that happened, and, and what also is very important, there were anthologies that came from India in print form around that time in the 1920s, when this art form uh, just showed up. It, it, just, it just came out. And I guess it had to do with uh, the fact that indentured laborers could now freely move between estates where they couldn't before. So that, that, that actually influenced uh, a change in ideas or exchange in ideas, which leads to new creativeness. And that's how it came there. The, so this local classical and the Logit still existed, but the Logit, I don't know if you guys know Sundar Popo. Uh, I think he's the father of Chutney music. There is, there is a discrimination within the context of the Indo-Caribbean experience, as we see in Guyana that happened recently with the change of administration and exists in Trinidad as well. So that the Indo-Caribbean people uh, are not, or their culture not necessarily seen as part of the part of the tapestry of whichever country of the three, but things happen where there was a reinvention of the Logi tradition, the Logi tradition, specifically the Matikur uh, uh, and the Bhatwan. Uh, it's outside the scopes, if anybody wants to ask questions about those, they could ask any question and answer. Um, part of this presentation. Um, Sundar Popo started singing songs that women would sing during the uh, Mati Kaur, and uh, that became very popular. It's one is Hamna Jaibe Sasura Gharame Baba, which is a popular one that Kanchan sang of, and Kanchan and Babla also were a kind of uh, a Philip in that evolution. So around the 1960s and the 1970s, these low beat songs started to become more a tempo, get some beats from, we live in a, even though we English speaking, live very close to South America to uh, uh, Spanish speaking countries. So we were once Spanish. And a lot of the beats in our soca music and calypso music have that Spanish Latin beat. And that kind of got meshed into that song tradition. Now, this chutney music was quite interesting because it now got a new wave of young people interested in their culture. I remember in my secondary school days, we used to sing chutney music uh, during recess, during lunchtime, um, and even it went into medical school days. We were empowered in that identity um, to sing these songs. And now that chutney music has evolved into what we call chutney soca. And chutney soca is again something that is because, I mean, yes, I belong to a particular generation, but now there are younger ones coming up. And these, this younger generation, which is one generation below me, now like this chutney soca music. Chutney soca music has existing in it, Hindustani words, uh, but mostly uh, English Creole in it. And there's a competition that exists, which is called the Chutney Soka Monarch, which is uh, kind of equivalent to the Soka Monarch, which happens during carnival time, where Indo-Caribbean people really didn't get the opportunity to exist in the space and sing Soka. So they had Chutney Soka, which now exists. And now there is a mesh in between the two where Soka artists come and sing Chutney Soka and vice versa. So it, it created a space for Indo-Caribbean identity on the national stage. Um, that's a quite a, a very uh, important point. Um, and now it's actually gone online because Caribbean Hindustan is collaborating with uh, chutneymusic.com. Uh, you need to check that out where true Caribbean Hindustani and Chutney Music, now we're trying to revive the language through the song. A lot of these Chutney songs uh, the young ones sing it, but they don't know what they're singing, and then there are mispronunciations of it. So the collaboration now has created uh, translations for all these songs that we all knew for so many years, but didn't know the meaning of it. Uh, there's a large archive of these translations on Caribbean Hindustani, uh, the Facebook page. Um, but now the Chutney Soka is online. So chutneymusic.com actually inviting artists to come and enter and we also want them to create a new melody. For instance, Chutney Soka was usually Bollywood melodies 
um, that they would sing over with English Creole uh, uh, lyrics and then add in some Hindustani words, but it, it didn't really, it lacked that creativity. So we actually have entries now in the competition where um, people compose new Hindustani lyrics, be it in Bhojpuri or Hindi, which is, which is quite interesting and something we want to encourage. Um, in the bhasha aspect of it, I want to speak about my dad's pua. Uh, okay, two examples I'm going to give. My nani used to say here, bring it by here which we thought was a corrupted version of here. I remember one time I was a small and I stayed home and rain was falling and I told my mom, well, look, it have, a, it have plenty of water here. And she was like, don't say here, it's here. But when I started researching, uh, because when you learn Hindi now, <laughs> you, you learn Yaha and Vaha, but in Bhojpuri it's here and Hua. So my nanny was actually using the Bhojpuri word here um, I go into my dad's pua now. One time we had a conversation and she's like, yeah, this is Trinidad English Creole. And it shows how Trinidad English Creole has elements of Hindustan in it. So she said, yeah, easy now, boy. Them thief and them shooting the kake wheel and thing. So kake wheel, that's Hindustani. E is Bhojpuri for it, which is uh, ye or yaha in Hindi. Um, and then my nanny used to have this expression, my kiriya go knock you down. I go knock you down is Trinidad English cruel, but my kiriya is makasam. Kiriya is a Bhojpuri word, it doesn't exist in Hindi. So you see, the thing is that there's this gap in Hindi classes where you learn modern standard Hindi words, but these are not the words that belong to our original ancestral language. Um, and I think looking back at things like Kabir Saki's and Kabir poems, Mirabai, which is in Braj and so on. I, I, when I do research, I find these words I grew up with in these literary expressions. And that says a lot. Um, that essentially do, the domains that exist in. So the important thing now is that it exists in certain domains so that I think it is, the onus is on us now to utilize these domains to try to teach the language. And I'm gonna show you what Caribbean Hindustani has done as well as other organizations in Trinidad. Um, in this final part of the presentation. Next slide. Um, so in Trinidad and Tobago, there are Hindi classes. We, I think we have a large deal of Hindi classes. Um, the High Commission of India does Hindi classes. Um, at one time, the High Commission of India had set up a Hindi chair at the University of the West Indies um, to teach Hindi. And that's how I learned Hindi because that chair was responsible for teaching okay. students that were coming. I did it up to advance. And um, High Commission also gives scholarships to Agra University uh, for people to go and do Hindi at various levels, a diploma level, undergrad level, postgrad level, and PhD. The thing is that Hindi, honestly, yeah, because I remember my mom said, once you, I remember when I decided to do Hindi at university, my mom was like, well, once you could read and write, one ka, 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 ga, ga, then you're good. You don't need to learn anything else. Because the thing is that I have found that in the Indo-Caribbean space, the Indo-Caribbean people themselves actually still associate Hindi Hindustani with a sort of inferiority complex. And they do see it as a way forward for their children for upward social mobility. So uh, that's not their fault, that's, that's the result of colonialism, but I think that it's time now where it exists for some sort of research so that now we could create the space for it to exist. And this is what I'm gonna describe. So I am also a member of the Hindi Foundation of Trans Tobago. And what has been done is that the Hindi Foundation of Trans Tobago had written up a memorandum of understanding for with the, the Ministry of Education so that the Hindi Nidhi has, at least at one secondary school, a convent in Kuva, that's a central Trinidad. Uh, you could write up Cambridge, Cambridge level exams in Hindi and that cohort is still occurring. That has to be developed though, because we do have French and Spanish at secondary school and now we have Spanish at primary school. So the foundation actually endeavored on engaging the World Hindi Secretary at Mauritius, 
we're, supp we're supposed to have a workshop for teachers because it is in the syllabus that Hindi, Hindi has created. Just like we teach Spanish in primary schools, uh, it is very possible to teach Hindi in primary schools. Everything is set up. You just need, uh, uh, we just need to know was the way forward with regard to putting place together uh, taught. I think that's very possible. That's very possible and could be brought to fruition in the next five years. Um, and then, well, Caribbean Hindustani. Now, Caribbean Hindustani, which I established, we have a Hindi Bajit every two, two, two times for the week. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it creates that space for the Hindi learner to now come and practice the language. Um, I speak five languages. Hindi is one, Trinidad, Bhojpuri, Dutch, French, and French Creole, English. I don't know which one I miss. I'm doing Spanish now. But the thing is that if you learn a language, you have to have this set goal as to what you want because a lot of people learn languages. Hindi is no exception and just keep the grammar and vocabulary in their head, but the, the, the space is not created to speak it. And then even you might know all the Hindi grammar in the world and vocabulary, but if you don't use it, that's a stored in a certain part of your brain where it's not conversant. So you need to start make it store it in a different part of your brain where you become conversant. And to do that, you have to make the mistakes when you speak. Uh, in any language, you have to make the mistakes. And I think that's for English speakers, that's an most, well, at least the Indo-Caribbean people in Ghana and Trinidad, we are English speakers. So we have a aversion towards learning a, a second language. In Suriname, it's quite different. They actually speak three languages. The average Suriname speak three. Right in the in, in the Surinamese world, it's Hindustani, which is Surinami, Dutch, and Surinantong, right? Um, so that's one thing that we need to do, create a space for it to be spoken, which Caribbean Hindustani has been doing, as well as we also do formal Hindi classes. So we have a current cohort where we teach uh, students to prepare for the uh, Hindi certificate course in India, correspondent course. So we submit, they submit uh, their uh, coursework and then they write an exam and so they get a, a certificate a certificate of their proficiency and um, Trinidad, Bhojpur, Trinidad Bhojpuri classes will uh, has already started we did uh, um, Caribbean Design did it at the Lloyd Best Institute there was a beginner's level and um, I had also done a beginner's course in Trinidad Bhojpuri for the national community um, on TV6, uh, a national station here for Indian Arrival, we did four episodes of Beginners Trinidad Bhojpuri. Um, we have now started to continue the content and the work of Peggy Mohan, Trinidad Bhojpuri Morphological Study, Moti Mare, who had mentioned, Sarnami Byakaran, and one more person, uh, Dr. Gambhir, Surendra Gambhir, he did Ghanese Bhojpuri. I have all their work in archive and we utilize in that to create a standard dictionary and grammar for Caribbean Hindustani. Um, and we also embark in on Tamil classes uh, because that's also part of the diaspora. Uh, a lot of the French Antilles came from Pondicherry because that was where the French colony was in India during the leadership. So they actually focus on Tamil, uh, which is also part of our heritage in the Indo-Caribbean space. Next slide. Networking, quite important. And I hinted to that sometime earlier. So Caribbean Hindustani has established links in all these countries with our work. And uh, I'll give some examples. So Gangs of Wasipur, um, I collaborated with uh, Sneha Kanwalkar. She's the music producer. She had come to Trinidad and we got two singers here for Chutney Music, Rasika Dindial and Vide Suku to do uh, soundtracks for those Bollywood movies. So that's a big deal. Um, through the SR music group run by Surin Ramkilavan in the Netherlands, they have created a syllabus for Dholak, the, our particular local classical Bahitagana style. So we work with them to establish that throughout the diaspora so that we teach the young ones our style of Dholak. And we now even working on the notations of the local classical songs to try to document them and create a syllabus to teach this particular aspect of our song tradition, um, as well as the language, which is quite important. 
a lot of people don't know in Jamaica and Belize, there are Indo-Caribbean people living there, those who are descendants of indentured laborers, far less than Trinidad, Guyana, and Suriname, but they do exist. And Logit, Bhojpuri Logit is, is still sung in Jamaica up to today. And a lot of these countries, because they're in a minority, actually look into Trinidad, Guyana, and Suriname to kind of extend the knowledge. The French Antilles, I mentioned Europe, Canada, and the US, which has a secondary diaspora who also are yearning and thirsting for this information. And we have also linked with South Africa, Fiji, and Mauritius, again, where Bhujpuri is spoken, because we all come from the same parts in India. Next slide. Right, and then through the UNESCO and ancestral languages, uh, the loss of language and impact on culture, the loss of and the ability to hear the sound and the poetic language of like Ram Chiritramanas, a lot is lost when we do really understand the language. Um, and we see that when the language is lost here, um, a lot of the artists who don't know the language just heard what the their guru would have taught them and they were, they were, it was lost in translation in English over time. So sometimes it's not the actual meaning of the song. Um, the poetry and the sound of our language um, gives us the abil ability to re remember that narrative. Um, Again, Bhojpuri traditions, like Sanskrit initially from the Vedas, was an oral tradition. Yeah, the written, the written form of Hindustani languages came much longer after. Um, but for thousands of years, Vedas has been transmitted through, through oral tradition, just like most of our song traditions here in the Indo-Caribbean experience. Um, and then, yeah, there's a lot about like yoga today in, you Western world, it's just yoga. All the other, as, other aspects of it uh, with prayer, uh, pranayam, philosophy behind it, and the traditions even in the language are lost. So it's, it's, it's disjointed and uh, we need to do something about it. A language being quite important. Good, I don't know how much time I took there, but we have a few samples of the language being spoken and one or two songs. So Samira agreed, uh, well, I mean, the last slide really focuses on we Caribbean Hindustani is asking for stakeholders who might be interested, anybody who uh, would be able to sponsor and invest in this initiative, um, networking. Uh, if you know anybody who can assist even in things like Bhojpuri translation and well investment. Uh, if you think you could help, uh, just uh, info at CaribbeanHindustani.org as well as you could send a, a Facebook message on our Caribbean Hindustani page. Yeah, I think that was the last slide. Yeah, these are my references, which I alluded to when uh, I was doing the presentation. Right, and before the questions, we'll just probably show a few of the uh, videos, just so we hear the language. These are quite rare. Well, he's getting ready. Some are interviews I would have done and some are songs. Yeah, so you can play this one. Before I play it, I'll just explain what it is. This is a logit. This is the when the mother is given the last milk to the bridegroom before he leaves for his uh, Dullahin's house. Not hear any audio. Yeah, Samir, I have to check the audio. I have to do something special for the audio. I don't know. I think once you share, what? Okay, so stop sharing and then reshare it with the audio. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Oh, 
Oh yeah, share computer sound. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. Right. And this is in Suriname in Nikiri. This is a interview I had done with. Well, she's she's no longer alive. Or Nikiri log Guyana um Jaila kam karike kam karike kate. Ah, okay. Guy Guyanese log um John Hiape um Isle. जाने बत्ती आवे हिंदुस्तानी हाँ ढेर मिला जाने बत्ती आए हम्म कहे कि आ हम सोचे ला गायनीज लोग जैसे चुनिंदार लोग ना जाने बत्ती आवे हाँ हाँ but जॉन गायनीज लोग हिया हिया आयल जाने बत्ती आवे ना सीखे 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 जिन तो धीरे धीरे से सीखे हैं जी माने सीखे तो सीखे जिन ना माने सीखे उरी उरी � Yeah, this is a Mahanta, Kabir Pant Mahant, in Trinidad. Shri Shri Ram. Our name is Visham. 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 Yeah, Trinidad. We are Trinidad. We are in Colombia. 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 We are in San Francisco. और हम जाने ला कि रात देश में नौजवान लोग ना जाने बोलते हैं अभी हिंदुस्तानी ता सुरीनाम में खूब खूब चले ला बचवन औरत आदमी सब जाने बोलते हैं अभी हिंदुस्तानी और ईगो हमार एक हिंदुस्तानी दोस्त है ये पब्लिक वाले फॉर्ड नहीं हैं एमसी हाँ कि चार लोग शमीरे जाए क्या चार लोग घर घर से लड़का नहीं आवे हाँ और कोई बच्चा नहीं आवे हाँ कब जाए घरे हाँ ना आए तो धोए के हाँ ना बैठ के आवे तो ठीक आवे हाँ हाँ yeah. This is a uh, from Trinidad. Yeah. This is a just Trinidad Bhojpuri. To her pura naam ka ba? Aaj ya kaule sa. Aaya. To her janam ka ha ba? Mar janam ba? Garkanda ba? Garkan Garkanda ba? Nijme? Mar aaj ki aaj a muluk se aaye muhe. Garkanda. Aaj a aaj hi. और आजा आजी के के नाम का कारण आजा के नाम जानी बा आज के नाम ना जान ना जान आजा के नाम बा दिल्लिया दिल्लिया आज के नाम ना जान ना कुछ लिया आ ना हमारा आज बोला ना ना जान तो मुलुक से तुहार आजा कौन झिला से आम आए ना ना बोला हम के कहाँ से सब आए? तो यहाँ से। ये जो ये जो लोग हैं, वो आज स्पोक अब आज स्पोक अब वो बिकेम चटनी इवेंटली। ससु पूछे ला बहर तू कौन है मसलवा तो खेले हरिलवा सुनर भाई
I think it's like so hard. This is the local classical. I think it's that familiar. Yeah, and this is a Trinidadian who went back to her family. We all know her. she's probably here. Um, she was interviewed in Hindi and in national TV. I think दादा 1819 में फ्रेंड आप गए थे और हम हमेशा सोचते हैं कि किस गांव दादा से आए थे क्योंकि जब हम दादा बूढ़े दादा बूढ़े थे हमेशा कहते हैं क्या हम दादा बहुत दादे से किस से हम मरे जाएं हम सुमेर हम इंडिया जाएंगा हाँ जब बूढ़े हमेशा रोते रोते हैं Hey Ramsume, Ramsume is my friend, so we are going to go to India, but we don't come back. So my first daughter, we all know this, because we always do this with them. So when we think that we will go, we were researching, and we got an immigration pass. And on the immigration pass, the name of Ajamgar, चवेता के विलेज है तो हम ढूंढ है और मिला था विलेज तो आज मैं पहली बार आई थी लेकिन वो दो साल पहले आए थे और हम जब हम गांव में हैं परिवार आते हैं हम रोते हैं या आई थिंक नाउ दैट वाज इट देयर एंड आई सो सम क्वेश्चंस कमिंग अप सो आई थिंक या दैट इज द एंड थैंक्स एंड आई गेस एनी क्वेश्चंस कैन � I did see some questions. Uh, one was how do Indians trace their ancestry? So we have one anthropologist here in Trinidad, Shamshuddin. That's his profession. Uh, he, Kamala Pasabi Sessa, as well as Bastil Pandey, two of our former prime ministers uh, of persons of Indian origin, uh, were able to trace their ancestry uh, via his services. Um, but Caribbean Hindustan is in conversation with the High Commissioner of India to set up a database so it's much easier. Because in Suriname, there's a database. You don't need to go to the National Archives. Everything is on uh, the computer. So Surinamese people could easily go on the computer and uh, try to trace back their roots. So it's much easier. Rajesh Ji has a question. OK. Yeah, Namaste Visham Ji. The, uh, thank you, Dhanyawad, for the presentation. It is very impressive, all the work that you have done, uh, you know, doing all the linguistic studies and tracing it and trying to preserve it. Uh, my question goes to the beginning of your presentation. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm just curious. I know, uh, I mean, uh, I've been looking at the initiatives from the Government of India as well about they're trying to connect the Girmitia, as they call, uh, all the indentured laborers that were gone. Uh, my question goes back to the, during this period, uh, 1830s, 1840s, uh, before that was the slave trade during the colonial period, the indentured laborers, when they were taken from different parts of India, was it similar to how they were uh, forcibly like slave, slaves were taken or was it a voluntary thing? You signed a contract with the government uh, or with the rulers? So, we, we hear two stories. So there's a popular story from the Narayan Singh family, Professor Vijay Narayan Singh, a, uh, a professor here at university who also taught me. They did some research and they, uh, their story is that their great 
great grandfather was kidnapped. Moti Marhe, who I mentioned earlier. Somebody asked which thesis it was. Peggy Mohan, Trinidad Bhojpuri Morphological Study, and uh, um, Moti Lal Marhe, Sarnami Byakaran. Um, yeah. Uh, he, so Moti did an interview with the last indentured laborer who lived in the Netherlands, and she also was a child and she was kidnapped. So we hear a lot of these stories of kidnapping. We also know that many did come voluntarily and uh, two factors contributed. One was that uh, industrial revolution started. So most of the artisans didn't have any way to earn money anymore, uh, whether it be weaving, jewelry or anything because everything was industrialized. Um, there were also spates of famine that took place in uh, UP Bihar around that 18, 1830 to 19, uh, uh, 20th period that also, uh, so food was difficult to get, the economy was really bad. A lot of endangered laborers left voluntarily because of the hardships they faced in India and they were stored. So when they came to Trinidad, indentorship was I think five to seven years and they had an option to go back or stay, uh, being granted parcels of land. These lands, albeit was swamp land and, and land that could not be cultivated. Luckily the indentured laborers and they were at all a knowledge of agriculture. So we could drive from Port of Spain or capital to San Fernando, the second city or smaller city. Um, now, because of the uh, agricultural mastermind of indentured laborers who fill in those uh, swamp areas and now we could build a highway over it. Um, uh, my own personal story is my uh, Par Ajan's brother, so Bimal and Timal, Bimal's and Timal's related, and a mother came we understand they went to Jamaica first, then went back to India and then came to Trinidad. So there are repeated stories of some going back, but they came back because it didn't meet any improvement in India. Um, you could say indentorship and uh, slavery were quite the same. Uh, they just named it indentorship. There's a documentary, um, the reinvention of indentorship, the reinvention of slavery, um, because it was, it was no different with regard to uh, the conditions that they would have worked under and what they would have it. Mike, Michael Anthony, uh, please go ahead. Hi, Visham. Thank you for your presentation. Wanted to ask more about the languages. So recognizing that people came from different parts at different times, do any of the indentured documents would have indicated their language or is it just based off of where they originated? So like immigration passes or ship roles? So you have to understand that. Okay, so one important thing happened around that time. I pointed out that Persian was uh, displaced as the language administration for Hindi, in Hindu Sani Urdu. Um, also that Gresan did his research on India at that point. So. During indentorship, the cognizance of what is Bhojpuri or the cognizance of uh, what is Maithili or Magahi wasn't there. It was all Hindustani because my grandparents would say um, that their parents would speak Hindustani. That's then what they know it as. And then later on, they'll call it Hindi. Um, as well, well, one other term was Indian. So if I asked my Nana, if he know what Bhojpuri is, he would he didn't know what that was. So this designation of names during the indentorship period wasn't as concrete as it is today in modern India. Um, Peggy Mohan in her novel, Jahajin, which recounted her research in Trinidad Bhujpuri, um, said that her, uh, I think it was a great grandmother spoke Kariboli. So that what is modern standard Hindi was spoken by uh, some indentured laborers, but um, it not, not as many and uh, at that time, our Dibraj had more authority than Kariboli. Kariboli was only coming up in literature. Prior to the 1800s, uh, there, was not, not, there wasn't really any significant literature in Kariboli. It was more our Dian Braj. So the reason for the fact that this research by Gresson only came up just coming to the beginning of the indentorship period, the acceptance of these names uh, like when I grew up and they spoke, they said Hindustani, they never said Bhojpuri. I only encountered this at a university level. So it seems that that designation of the different vernacular slash languages spoken came long after indentorship. Imaji, please go ahead.
Himaji, please go ahead. Okay, I think she's muted. There's some questions in the chat. Uh, I don't know if you can see them. Yeah, Just, uh, yeah I have to go. It is a bit. All right, let me try. Right. Do you teach your kids any Hindustani language or music? Or oh, this is getting extinct with the older generation. All right. Um, yes, the fantasies and desires of the Indo-Caribbean community is great. But as I pointed out, a lot of these are not standardized. We have a standard education system in English and at university um, that teaches us, well, Christian culture, essentially. Um, but the, the thing is that I think the diaspora itself needs to become more organized to formalize and standardize, have syllabus and uh, curriculum to teach these things, which Caribbean Hindustani is working on. That's actually what's lacking. Um, even the Hindi language itself, you'd expect it coming out of India would have, like I did French at Alliance Francaise. Oh, there's an Alliance Francaise in all countries where there's a consulate, where the government of education and the external ministry of foreign affairs collaborate to teach the language to their system. That doesn't exist 100% in India. And then even in Trinidad, there's no standard textbook. Each Hindi teacher uses what they, they might have available to them. So whereas I did Spanish in school with all of us using the Viva textbook levels one to five with reference text, a syllabus and a curriculum to guide us, none of that exists currently for Hindi in, 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 in Trinidad. So just look at something that internationally has a, 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 re a recognizable standard by institution in Trinidad is completely disorganized. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to go a little bit at the level of how to create policy, how to re recreate uh, a curriculum, something standard that now exists in at least the Ministry of Education to get that done, even for the music and everything else. Um, the other question is... Ananji oh, has a question. Sure. Is, uh, Ananji, please go ahead. Thank you very much for a great uh, uh, presentation. I see that several cultures came in uh, the Caribbean mm -hmm. and you must have had a lot of travels, lot of problems also. So mm -hmm. in that, how did the culture and the language uh, play a role in surviving those crises? And how did the language survive? Well, I mean, honestly, in all three countries, Suriname included, it's on a decline, even though it's still conversant there, because you still find young children choose to speak Dutch or Sonantongo, and less so Hindustani, even though they can understand it. Um, I, I, I noticed that in Suriname, there are two, one to two generations behind us with regard to that process. Because just like my mamu could understand when I speak Hindustani, but couldn't respond, the younger generation now in Netherlands and Suriname are, are the youngest generation is at, at that level. Um, with regard to Trinidad and Tobago, one thing is unique about us, we were oil and gas based. So that, um, and then Indians had moved up the social ladder through education. So we became entrepreneurs, businessmen and so. So the resources that was available through oil and gas uh, pushed the Indo-Trinidadian to do things like uh, record albums and chutney music. Um, the Surinamese actually didn't have that fi financial backing and came to Trinidad to do their recordings. So the economy was one thing going well for Trinidad and Tobago. Um, you'd find in the English colonies, or as so well English colonies, Guyana and Trinidad, uh, they have a similar story. Trinidad is a small island, whereas Guyana is a huge space in South America, but yet the language has suffered to some extent. Because of Richard, the song traditions, yeah. Richard, you can start your video if you can. Oh, sorry. What happened there is I looking at the chat to get the questions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, the song traditions is very much alive, as well as the ritual traditions like puja, um, Diwali is a national holiday here. So I think, um, and. I must commend organizations like the Hindi Foundation of Trans Tobago and the National Council of Indian Culture. I'm also a member of that organization who created Diwali Nagar, uh, creates a national space for everyone 
not only the Indo Trinidadian or Indo Caribbean, but everyone in the Caribbean to celebrate Diwali on one national stage. Um, so I think the entrepreneurship of the Indo Caribbean people has led to that promotion. Um, unfortunately, uh, one thing that has been neglected is the language, and that's why Caribbean Hindustan is here. Okay, I'll read all the other questions to you. Sure. Uh, this is Sudarshan ji. He is saying, how is the government of India supporting? Is there a close coordination? And what is the need of the hour? Um, yes, because of the High Commission of India, there are a lot of Hindi classes available to anybody in Trinidad. Um, but I think the hindrance more is the... Uh, there's no glamour in learning Hindi. Uh, there's no job created uh, by learning Hindi. So that the public relations of it among the Trinidad community, especially among the Indo-Caribbean people themselves, needs to be more organized. And I put that on the mandirs and the organizations like the Sanatan Dharma Mahasabha, um, who are organizations I think should advocate for it because I mean, our, our scriptures and texts, yes, in Sanskrit, but they're also in Awadhi Braj and so on. Ram Chitra Manas is in Awadhi. So I think that, yeah, we need somebody to champion the cause here for the language in Trinidad uh, by getting these things in place. I think it is absolutely possible because if you can have Spanish being taught at primary school and in the curriculum of the primary school is mentioned heritage languages, Hindi being one, uh, I think that our our own people need to organize ourselves to advocate and make it come to fruition. Uh, do the Hindu schools teach the primary kids uh, in the reading and writing? Yes, but unfortunately, in all schools, even the one I had mentioned earlier, the convent, um, the Hindi Foundation has not been able to extend the MOU to now make Hindi part of the academic timetable. So you'd find that these classes are taught after hours or not in the academic timetable. So I think um, they should yes. incorporate it in the primary, like it should be like we learned Hindi because it was part of our subject and we learned the AEE Barakhadi since childhood. So that that I think that will that is a better way to get the children involved. Ag agreed, but then that it, it, it is slowly taking place uh, uh, because the Hindi Foundation has done a curriculum for primary schools. We need to re-engage the, it's in the process. So I assume, well, let's say in the next two years, then we should have teachers ready to teach basic Hindi at primary schools from infant class, which starts at age five. That's true, yeah. Uh, so there's a couple of other questions by Rajesh Ji. One is, is that, uh, is it a burning desire to trace ancestry uh, among the trainees? Yes, it is. It is very much so. Um, but unfortunately, we only have one person who does it. So we need to open up a network like Ancestry.com for uh, Indo-Caribbean people in general. Uh, Caribbean Hindustani is currently engaging the High Commission to try to see how best we could get it as a online archive so people could probably try to get that information online but a lot of background things has to go into it as well like for instance for my my ancestors um you had well you, you had to know which year they came in and the name of the ship and once you get that then you go through the, all the people that came on the ship and see the name is there as well and then you could get the immigration papers some people were able to get the and the completion of indentorship uh, papers as well but a lot of work needs to be done with regard to making it more available for at least uh, Indo Trinidadian people. So, Rajesh ji has a question How can the newer Indian diaspora help uh, or network with Indo Caribbeans? That means he's talking about the ones in USA and Canada who have come from India. Um, the Indo Caribbean, the Indo Caribbean identity is unique. Um, yes, it shares root with uh, modern day Indian nationals, but at least looking at the initiatives between Car Caribbean Hindustani and chutneymusic.com, the language is, is quite something quite important. Um, and the domains in which it exists, which are expressed here. So for instance, there's a yearning of young, young Indo-Caribbean people who have moved 
to Canada as well as US and uh, even the, the Surinamese who moved to the Netherlands to understand Bollywood music. Um, you must agree that the Hindustani or Hindi in Bollywood, the vocabulary that is encountered is not the same vocabulary you'd learn in a Hindi class or that provided from India. For instance, Nazara and Nazar. Um, there yeah, are Bolli few... Bollywood uses a lot of Urdu. Yeah. Right. But again, remember what I find is that at least in the classes provided, you see, the thing is for the Indo Caribbean experience, our vocabulary of our Hindustani is uh, a bit unique to us, right? For instance, you learn the word makan in for how for how so where well, it means in an urban area, but we know ghar, right? Um, and which is more a village context. I'll give you an next example. Uh, so kutta is the word for dog, but we know it as kukur, right? Which still exists in Hindi, but less so. Um, there are other words like you say chakki. We uh, I'm sorry, chak. Well, we say jata. You say chakla. We say chauki. Um, and then there, there are variants like uh, you say ukhal musal, we say ukriyan musal. So, and then there's a word called arauni, which exists in Hindi, but more northeastern Hindi, which is the awning, where prevents the bauchar from coming in, or you still get bauchar. So, um, that that I think one thing I think that needs to improve is the vocabulary or a brand of Hindi that is uh, resonates with us. Um, Sometimes when I say certain words that people hear um, in songs, uh, they light up because they get to understand a little better. But unfortunately, what is present in our current day Hindi curriculum, at least from India, doesn't really cater to make that connection. Uh, Jayanti Ji wants to ask a question. Uh, Jayanti Ji, you can mute, mute yourself, unmute. Uh, thank you very much. That's been a lot of uh, knowledge uh, uh, on Sunday morning. I'm here in Singapore. I have migrated from India for the past 25 years. And my question is, I see children who are totally the second generation children after me who are brought up in Singapore have a lot of access to all the Indian TV channels. And uh, I, I know when I'm watching, my children are picking up a lot of words here and there, and it's helping a lot. So is, are these uh, uh, channels available in, uh, in the Caribbean islands, which uh, I think is very useful to pick up a language? Okay. Yes, we have about over 10 Hindustani radio stations. I do Hindi Samjana on one of the stations where I use Bollywood content to teach a language. But that is unfortunately the only initiative to utilize the content to teach. Um, we have radio programs, local content of local Hindustani content, Bollywood content, Ghazal, uh, Kawali, all these things. Uh, because what is popular in India is quite popular here among our Indo Trinidadian people. Um, and there's the TV as well as Star TV available on cable. My mom, I speak Hindi, but my mom doesn't speak Hindi and doesn't understand Hindi. My nani used to her mom, but uh, mom still looks at uh, these uh, soaps that exist in these uh, Indian stations. I think a lot of them come out of the US. Uh, now, luckily, there are subtitles, so she kind of understands them. But it's, oh. it, is, it is readily available. It is readily available. Uh, before this, this the, the, the influx of immigrants from Venezuela came to Trinidad, because now it's just like if you go into Miami International Airport, you hear Spanish as uh, more often than English. Um, now it's kind of like that here, but prior to that, Hindi was actually the second language that was most encountered after English. So it is available, at least from when I was a child, a lot, of, a lot had changed. When I was in secondary school, there was one or three FM that played mostly Bollywood and local Hindustani content, mm -hmm. and then it just exploded. So it, it, it is available, but there's still some, there's a gap. There's, I mean, uh, Jason, I think is here and would be very supportive of this. Young people actually love the Hindustani content, but there's no avenue created for them to learn the language. I know in Suriname, when I listen to the radio stations and in the Netherlands, the Hindustani content, the announcers speak Suriname or Hindi in their presentation. So that yeah. is something you can look at. Uh, let the, okay. the radio announcers learn some basic Hindi uh, so that their presentations improve for the sake of promoting language. 
Uh, there's a question uh, it's saying uh, uh, the about bhajans. Uh, bhajans are one channel which have kept the language and spirituality, spirituality alive in the Caribbean. Does the younger generation still enjoy singing bhajans, although they do not understand the full meaning? I mean, it, it extends beyond bhajans, but yes, uh, a lot of young children go to mandir still. Well, after COVID, it get a little, but a lot of the, 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 the mandir sessions came online. But yeah, as I said, Maram Charitramanas, as well as bhajans, um, as well, a lot of young children and in the Hindu schools, they do teach the bhajans. But just like all the other content, the average Trinidadian can sing a Hindi song with the most attachment and emotion, but still don't understand what you would say. Perfect, yeah. So it looks like uh, we have finished with the questions and uh, we had a very, very enlightening session, uh, I guess. Uh, since I've stayed there for three years, I know a lot about Caribbean, but a lot of our viewers today have learned something new. And uh, thank you, Vishamji, for taking your time and uh, giving us this perspective of uh, a Caribbean, especially Caribbean Hindustani. And uh, we hopefully, we next time I come to Trinidad, I'll be able to speak in Bhojpuri or Hindi or Hindustani with more people, uh, especially people from your classes. So thanks again and uh, good night to you.